Welcome to today's webinar, Updates from Quarry 2019, Treatment of HIV and its Complications. I would like to introduce Timothy J. Wilkin, MD, MPH, Associate Professor of Medicine in Wheel Cornell Medicine in New York, New York. Welcome, Dr. Wilkin. Thank you, and welcome to everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar. We're going to talk about updates from CROI, treatment of HIV and its complications. So a few um, issues before we get started. Um, so you no longer need to type your name and institution in the chat box, uh, but remember you have to be pre-registered to be eligible to claim credits or certificates. Um, and then, sorry. And then uh, remember, if you've not logged on to the new website, use your email address and reset your password. And uh, this activity is available for 1.25 uh, Category 1 credits for CME. Um, there are also nursing and pharmacy credits available. Um, and the evaluations are due at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time today, or Daylight Savings Time, I should say. Uh, next, we have our grant support, um, and you can see the supporters there. So remember for the webinar, um, there's going to be a separate window that will show up for the poll questions. Uh, so remember to, to mark your um, answer on the poll questions, not in the chat sections. And then all the responses will be displayed afterwards. So we'll start with the first poll to get us started, warmed up. Go ahead and answer. So it looks like the uh, northeast just won out over the southeast. I want to display those results. All right. um, here's poll question two. Uh, when will the evaluation for this webinar, um, which you must complete in order to claim CME or other credit, uh, when will it be available on the My Activities page in your ISUSA account? All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so it should be available by 5 p.m. today. And then uh, poll question three, so rate your level of experience in the medical management of HIV infection. All right, so a very experienced audience, which is great. Okay, um, so I wanted to share my financial relationships here. 
So the learning objectives for today, uh, we hope that you will be able to list some investigational drugs that are being developed, developed for the treatment of HIV and its complications, describe some new data on the optimal management of antiretroviral therapy, and identify some complications and comorbidities of HIV infection. So here is our pre-test question. Two studies on long-acting um, cabotegravir and ropivirine were presented, which correctly summarizes the findings that injectable long-acting cabotegravir and ropivirine were non-inferior to oral antiretroviral therapy, but side effects often led to discontinuations. Um, injectable long-acting cabotegravir and ropivirine was non-inferior to oral ART, and side effects rarely led to discontinuation. Injectable long-acting cabotegravir and ropivirine were, was not inferior to oral ART, but resistance commonly developed upon failure with subtype B virus. Or injectable long-acting cabotegravir and ropivirine was inferior to continued oral ART. Okay, and so we'll um, go over that data later on and uh, have a post-test question. So um, the update, the first thing we're going to talk about is the possible second person cured of HIV that I'm sure many of you saw uh, in the news, if you, even if you didn't attend Croy. We'll review some new antiretroviral agents, and we'll talk about antiretroviral strategies uh, and spend a, a good amount of time on long-acting cabotegravir and ropivirine um, because this a uh, new approach to maintenance antiretroviral therapy um, should be approved by the end of the year and be available um, in clinical practice. We'll spend some time talking about women in HIV and in particular integrase inhibitors in pregnancy. And lastly, we'll finish up with complications and co-infections and spend a good amount of time talking about integrase inhibitors and weight gain and some new emerging data that was presented. Okay, so um, there was a second person uh, possibly cured of HIV. So this was a, a person who was diagnosed with HIV in 2003, had stage 4B Hodgkin's lymphoma, originally was treated with efavirin, tenofovir, and tricitabine, later ch uh, changed to raltegravir, tenofovir, and tricitabine, um, failed multiple lines of chemotherapy, and uh, was not a candidate for autologous stem cell transplant. So ended up having an allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant, a 9 out of 10 HLA match with a donor who was homozygous uh, for the CCR5 delta 32 deletion. And so I'll walk you through this graph. On the far um, left, sorry, um, you see this time period before the allogeneic stem cell transplant. There's actually some issues with adherence with some of the medications, uh, some viral breakthrough, and actually uh, change to ropivirine dolutegravir based regimen. Uh, this first vertical dashed line is the time of the allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Um, with the treatments, the T cell count went down uh, in the red line here, um, but really the viral load stayed undetectable uh, throughout. And then there were some ultra-sensitive measures thrown in later on. All of it was uh, really nothing detected. Uh, if we look at other measures of HIV, there was a measure of um, HIV DNA uh, in the, sorry, the, the green bar here. So just prior there were, to the transplant, there was the HIV DNA measured and really became completely undetectable after that. Um, and that was coincidence with the engraftment of the donor stem cells or the donor cells. If we look, they also did uh, the QVOA assay 
to look at um, inducible HIV expression or um, HIV growth and really found no detectable virus throughout. There was uh, one digital droplet PCR that found a little bit of HIV DNA in one test, but other than that, all of the um, tests were, were negative for HIV. And so if we compare this, the two patients, um, this patient was homozygous for the wild type CCR5, at least their donor was. Uh, they were known to be infected with R5 using virus, similar to the patient that was already um, cured of HIV. Uh, the cancers were different, um, and the treatments were different. Um, one important point was that this patient did not have whole body irradiation like the prior patient cured of HIV did. Uh, and there was really a reduced intensity to the chemotherapy and conditioning. And both, in both cases, they only had mild graft versus host disease, and both had the 100% T cell donor chimerism. So um, I think the investigators were a little bit cautious about saying for sure that the patient was cured. Um, I guess really only time will tell, but the, the patient fortunately remains off of antiretroviral therapy. I think that uh, this obviously is not a generalizable strategy for HIV cure, um, but it is important to note that this, um, the one case of HIV cure was replicated. So. Uh, does give some added emphasis to continued HIV cure research. So next we'll talk about um, investigational antiretroviral agents. So there were data presented on an HIV capsid inhibitor, and this is, will be the, or is the first in class HIV capsid inhibitor, uh, GS6207. So capsid um, is an essential, this um, process of capsid assembly and disassembly is essential for viral replication. So the capsid kind of encodes the inner core, and uh, there's um, the chance to block this process both as the capsid is assembled and also as it's uh, disassembled. Um, so this uh, capsid inhibitor, we don't really have antiretroviral data on it. This is really focused on pharmacokinetics. So this is being developed as a long-acting injection. And this shows you the pharmacokinetic uh, or the concentrations of the drug and various dosing cohorts um, over time. And so the y-axis has been weeks. And um, really very long half-life, very sustained drug levels. And so the presenters concluded that this could be dosed um, as a uh, every three months or perhaps even four months uh, as an injection. So that'll be exciting to see how this was, is paired with other drugs um, as a combination long-acting injectable regimen. There were also uh, data presented on the HIV maturation inhibitor. Uh, this was a GSK compound. And so just to remind you, maturation is a process where the gag polyprotein is cleaved and um, functional proteins are formed in the, and allowing for a mature virion. So protease inhibitors interfere with part of this process by blocking the viral protease enzyme. Uh, maturation inhibitors um, are, are a little bit different that they, they bind, they prevent the binding of the protease to a specific cleavage site. Uh, there have been maturation inhibitors developed in the past that have never really made it on to clinical practice for a variety of reasons. Um, so this compound um, has a uh, good pharmacokinetic profile, but really only when it's paired with a um, CYP3A4 inhibitor, uh, such as cobicistat or uh, ritonavir. Um, so this shows the antiviral activity. So these are several doses, from purple being the lowest dose with the lowest antiviral effect. And you can see higher uh, antiviral effects with the higher doses. Um, this was dose, I believe, for 10 days, and um, showed good activity and a good viral load decline. 
However, um, although they didn't mention this at the presentation, it's known that this compound is not moving forward in clinical development really because of an unattractive profile of requiring the pharmacokinetic boosting. Uh, but it does show that, um, you know, this, this class of compounds could be developed as they, you know, there's clearly active agents um, that, are, that lie in the class. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some new antiretroviral strategies. Um, there was a very interesting randomized controlled trial of viral load testing called the STREAM study. So I'll walk you through the design of this study. So this was done um, internationally in Sub-Saharan Africa, I believe, and it enrolled people that were living with HIV on stable antiretroviral therapy. So really, these were people that had started antiretroviral therapy six months prior, and the general standard of care in, this, um, in these settings is to get a viral load after six months. So uh, people came in, they were ensured to be eligible, and they were randomized to two different strategies. The first was the standard of care, where uh, they would see a nurse or doctor and have lab-based HIV viral load testing, meaning that they would get their blood drawn, they'd be sent off to a lab, and then the results would come back, you know, in a, a week or two, and those results would be communicated to the participants. Um, the interventional group looked at a different approach. Uh, they were uh, seen by nursing nurses, and um, they received a point-of-care viral load test. So this point-of-care viral load test is uh, an expert HIV viral load test. So uh, many of you may be familiar with expert uh, machines from Cepheid in your hospitals or institutions for tuberculosis testing. Um, and um, the, that platform is actually very multifunctional, and so they have a cartridge that can be used to analyze uh, blood samples for HIV viral load. So uh, the participants in this interventional arm got their blood drawn and immediately um, tested using the expert. And while the participant was in the clinic, they received the results. And then if there were needed modifications for adherence or, or whatever, um, the, those um, um, assessments or interventions were done. And then their goal was to look at how did they do virologically? Did they stay suppressed? Did they, um, re, were they retained in clinical care? And so their hypothesis was that this interventional arm, which required a little bit less resources, used uh, nurses, not doctors, they thought the hypothesis would be uh, non-inferior. What they found, actually, was that the interventional arm had much better outcomes. So they had greater virologic suppression than did the standard of care arm, uh, statistically superior um, virologic suppression a, a year. Um, and if you looked at various other um, markers of retention in care um, and various permutations of those endpoints, all of them really strongly favored this point of care viral load testing. So really more evidence about this um, sort of early engagement in care, you know, showing people their results and um, using that to really motivate adherence and keep people uh, sustained in care. So really very interesting results, and it'll be interesting to see if this actually becomes a strategy that's uh, used more widely. Okay, so next we're going to talk about um, the long-acting injectable cabotegravir and ropivirine studies. So there were two trials, uh, the FLARE trial and the ATLAS trial, and we'll go through both of them. The only difference really between the studies is that FLARE really originated with people that had never taken ART before, so uh, ART-naive population, and then started the strategy to get them suppressed, and then people were randomized to injectable or oral antiretroviral therapy. ATLAS that we'll talk about in just a moment uh, really took people that were already suppressed on a variety of oral regimens and then uh, randomized them to either move over to injectables or to stay on their oral regimen. So first, the FLARE study. So it started with 809 ART-naive people 
Uh, they had to have a viral load of at least 1,000 any CD4 count. And it's important to note that people with chronic hepatitis B are excluded because um, the cabotegravir tiger and bilpivirine has no treatment for hepatitis B. Um, so people were first induced in the study with dolutegravir or bacavir 3TC, a single tablet regimen for 20 weeks. Um, if they were undetectable, um, 16 weeks later, they were um, eligible for randomization, which is considered day one for the study. And so if they were randomized to the standard of care, the oral antiretroviral therapy, then they um, then they just stayed on the dolutegravir or bacavir 3TC. If they were randomized to the injectable, they first had a month of oral lead-in with oral cabotegravir and oral rilpivirine. And then if they tolerated that, they moved over to the injectable, uh, the monthly injectable uh, cabotegravir and rilpivirine long-acting formulations. Their primary endpoint was at 48 weeks. Um, after 96 weeks, the people in the maintenance phase will have the opportunity to move over to the injectable. Um, so just some baseline characteristics. The representation of women was um, typical for naive studies, although suboptimal at about 22%. Uh, they did have representation of people over the age of 50, uh, mostly white participants. Um, and about 20% of the population had a viral load over 100,000. The median baseline um, CD4 was fairly high at around um, 450, and uh, just small amounts of people co-infected with hepatitis C. Um, so these are the primary outcomes. So. Um, if we look at really the, uh, the virologic success between the two arms, um, both were uh, above 93%, 93.6% in the CAB ropivirine long-acting versus 93.3% uh, in the oral arm. Most of the people that did not have virologic success just simply didn't have virologic data in the window. Uh, and the rates of virologic non-response uh, were quite low at about 2%. So really only 2% had documented uh, detectable viral loads at that time point. Uh, no discernible difference, clearly meeting non-inferiority to the standard oral regimen um, at the week 48 time point. So if we look at some of the details of the uh, virologic outcomes, we can see that um, having HIV RNA over 50 was quite low in, in both groups, um, and really most of it was driven by the lack of virologic data. Um, there were people that had discontinued due to adverse events, uh, and people that had discontinued really for other reasons. So uh, we'll talk about this again with the second study, but there were um, three uh, cases of resistance in the cabotegravir and rilpivirine arm. Um, so interestingly, all of these came from Russia, and they all had the A1 subtype. So remember in the US, we have subtype B. Um, in uh, South Africa, they have predominantly subtype C and there can be uh, various types in uh, other regions of Central Europe and Africa. Um, so when these uh, patients um, or participants failed, they generally had NNRTI resistance that you can see in the column towards the right, um, as well as integrase inhibitor resistance. So you can see the full changes to the various um, integrase inhibitors that were noted at the time of virologic failure, as well as real pivoting. So all of these occurred in type, subtype A1 viruses. If, if we look at injection site reactions, so remember people are getting two separate injections every month. Um, the uh, graph on the left shows you the proportion that reported injection site reactions. 
you can see it was highest with the first injections and then generally diminished over time. Whether they actually diminished or people just reported them less often or became used to the side effects, we can't really tell based on these data, uh, but clearly they didn't seem to be worsening. Um, if you, to characterize the injections, um, there were, you know, an, a large number of individual in injection site reactions, so they're mostly characterized by pain, a uh, much smaller frequency of nodules or induration swelling or warmth. And uh, so generally the injection site reactions, it mostly pain, lasted uh, a median of three days. Uh, but there were only two participants that withdrew because of the injection site reactions. Two participants, less than 1%. So a very low number of people actually left the study because of these reactions. Um, so next we have the ATLAS study. So uh, really an identical design except that the people coming into the study uh, were already suppressed on uh, more typical oral antiretroviral regimens. So um, once they passed screening, people were ran and found to be undetectable at screening. People were randomized to either stay on their antiretroviral therapy or move over to the strategy of a long-acting injectable cabotegravir and ropivirine. So again, in the study, it started with a four-week oral lead-in with cabotegravir and ropivirine. If they were tolerating and still virally suppressed, they moved to the injections, monthly injections, and their primary endpoint was uh, at week 48. And after a year, the people on the oral uh, phase have the option of moving over to a new study that is actually investigating uh, every other month dosing, so every two month dosing, which is uh, not tested in this study, but has been, is tested in another ongoing study. Um, so again, these results are very similar. You see that the large majority of people had biologic success at week 48. Uh, with 95.5 in the oral um, combination antiretroviral therapy arm versus 92.5% in the CAB long-acting and reflivering long-acting arm. So uh, most of the people who had non-success were because of the lack of virologic data. Um, this uh, did meet non-inferiority, so um, the cabotegravir was found to be non-inferior to the um, oral antiretroviral therapy. Um, so similar to the last um, study, uh, there were a number of people who had no biologic data. Most of those um, had discontinued prior to this because of an adverse event. Um, and uh, other people discontinuing for other unspecified reasons. Um, the risk of um, having detectable viremia at that time point at week 48 was quite low in both arms, around 1 to 1.5%. One so the, there were three virologic failures in this arm, as, in this study as well. Two of them were type A1 viruses, and one was an AG recombinant virus. And so the same patterns of resistance um, emerged, so that generally people had NNRTI resistance as well as integrase, uh, some integrase resistance. Only one that seemed to have a marked change in, marked change in their IC50 to cabotegravir. Um, but again, uh, also in the, the type A1 viruses. So um, this got a lot of attention. Um, it's safe to say that there really isn't any understanding as to why that this subtype seems more prone to biologic failures. Uh, they didn't clearly present what the absolute risk of biologic failure in A1 subtypes is. But keep in mind, in other studies of dolutegravir as an oral therapy, all those naive studies and bictegravir naive studies, there were no cases of resistance, period. Um, so although the absolute rate of resistance in the study is low, 
I, I think that, you know, it's something that will deserve further attention. And um, I, at least based on these data, I would need to see much more before I would think about using these, um, this strategy in people with A1 virus or type A virus. So um, I think some more data should be coming out to further explain this, and I'm sure people are kind of looking into the mechanisms of why this subtype is more prone to the to develop um, uh, resistance. Um, but on the flip side, for the vast majority of people that we would see in the U.S. and um, really all over the world, you know, most people by far do not have the A1 subtype. So. Uh, and there was no resistance seen in other subtypes. So um, I think that this strategy will be attractive for many areas of the world and, you know, for most, most people, most subtypes of H HIV. Um, okay, so now we're going to move on to a different uh, maintenance strategy. So this is a, a study of a monoclonal antibody to CCR5, so the blocks uh, HIV binding of CCR5 called PRO140. So this is a pretty interesting study design. They presented some um, data before, and this is uh, some additional follow-up data. So they um, looked at this study as really monotherapy. So people were suppressed on oral ART coming into the study. They were shown to have CCR5 using HIV only. Um, and then they started the PRO140 and stopped their other HIV medications. Um, so they've had pretty large numbers of people um, enrolled into the study and have looked at successive cohorts. And so in the, you see on the left of the graph, the first cohort is the 350 milligram cohort. And so participants, um, had marked rate of really high rates of virologic failure in the first uh, three months, sort of lower in the second three months, and then lower still in the um, six months after that. You can see that they achieved better results with the 525 milligram group, uh, but still really marked um, virologic failure in the first three months and lower rates thereafter. Um, interestingly, they had less data in the 700 milligrams, um, and, but their initial data looks encouraging, so there is virologic failure in the first three months, but none that they documented in the three months after that. Uh, so we'll need additional uh, follow-up, but it's interesting that this um, strategy could even work as well as it seems to work in the 700 milligram. Um, so th um, this isn't approved here. I, I don't know that this would be a strategy that anyone would, would use anytime soon, but it, it is uh, an interesting approach to maintenance therapy. Um, you may have noted in the last month or so, um, dolutegravir lamivudine is uh, now approved by the FDA. I'm not sure when the drug has arrived in pharmacy. I saw the trade name somewhere, and I can't remember what it is for the life of me. But um, you know, this will this is available now by prescription. Uh, this fixed dose combination of dolutegravir and lamivudine. So to remind you, there were um, two very large naive studies that showed excellent results of dolutegravir lamivudine as compared to uh, I think dolutegravir lamivudine of Bacavir. And I can't remember the second. I think it was died. Yeah, I think they were both that study. But anyway, uh, both of the studies showed uh, nearly equivalent biologic results with three drug um, ART, no cases of resistance. So really uh, great outcomes. Um, this analysis was trying to address really the potency issue or the potency concern about this two-drug regimen of dolutegravir and lamivudine. So they did a target not detected analysis. So what this means, when you order a clinical viral load, you can get a result less than 20 not detected or detected less than 20. So um, what there's really not clinical utility in knowing whether the target was detected or not detected. At least we haven't demonstrated any clinical utility as of yet. 
Uh, but nevertheless, they wanted to look, are, are the rates of target not, achieving target not, de not detected any different between these two groups? And what they found was there really was no uh, difference. If anything, the difference, differences favor dolutegravir and 3TC. They were slightly more, more likely to, to have this target non-detected. And in addition, they looked at various bio, baseline viral load strata. And so if you just focus on the over 100,000, which I think you know, it's reasonable that people would be most concerned about virologic potency in that high viral load strata, uh, again, the target not detected was actually found a bit more often in the dolutegravir 3 tc 2 drug arm as opposed to the 3 drug arm. So um, I would say these results are reassuring for the 2 drug regimen, um, but again, this isn't something, a test that we really know how to use in clinical practice or really make any modifications for ART choices in clinical practice. So I think what's critical for the dolutegravir lamivudine um, uh, to know how to use it in clinical practice is really to have the longer term outcomes because we've seen the week 48 data. I'm not, I don't think the week 96 data or week 144 data have been presented, but those longer term outcomes will, will I think, be most important for, for reassuring um, treating providers about the long term potency of dolutegravir and 3T as a two-drug regimen. Okay, um, this trial was a trial that is looking at, um, it enrolled people that were on dolutegravir plus uh, FTC-TAF or FTC-TDF. Um, so people that were on a two-pill regimen and randomized them to either Victegravir or FTC-TAF or continuing on dolutegravir and FTC-TAF. Um, given that there were absolutely no differences between these two drugs and the head-to-head -head comparison of these, um, you know, it's not anticipated that these would be very exciting results. Uh, but anyway, they looked at the, um, in this study, they looked at people, you know, being randomized to one of these two regimens and then went back and did an archive DNA of their virus before the switch. And so, um, and then they've looked at the week 12 outcomes after the switch according to these baseline archived resistance. And so um, they had a variety of um, resistance that was found. Um, and so if you just focus on the NRTI resistance category, they had a group of people that had really more extensive resistance, so either K65R or greater than three TAMs. Um, and then they, the second group are people that had any other pattern of NRTI resistance. And the third was those that had no mutations whatsoever. And you can see that the results were pretty comparable between the three. They're not a really robust sample of people with the more extensive K65R or greater than three TAMs, um, but you know, still 97% maintain suppression after 12 weeks. Uh, in the bottom half, if you look at um, other types of resistance, um, uh, any, any PI, NRTI, and NRTI, or in, in integrase inhibitor resistance, um, or NNRTI, PI, whatever. All of the groups seem to perform quite similarly. Uh, the one hesitation or one point I'll just remind you of, in the, the um, dolutegravir monotherapy studies, you know, people did pretty well for about six months and then there were breakthroughs and in, uh, in, uh, in resistance to dolutegravir that emerged. So these are reassuring data that perhaps when using an integrase dolutegravir or bictegravir and uh, two NRTIs, that the baseline NRTI resistance pattern is not so relevant to the outcomes, uh, but I do think that we need longer term data on that. Uh, the other caveat with this analysis is that um, it used archive DNA and, and still we don't have a lot of um, data on how to reliably use that archive DNA um, data in clinical practice. 
Okay, um, so now we're going to move on to women in HIV, and so there's a few different studies that we will um, talk about. Um, the first was a, an analysis of tenofovir alafenamide, alafenamide versus tenofovir disproxyl fumarate in women. So um, in any one of the studies that compared these two drugs, there were not great representation of women. Um, but by pooling all of the data together, there's a, a more robust um, assessment um, in the subgroup of women that participated in the study. And so what they found in, when you split the data, either by people who st started a ran or randomized who were treatment naive, or those who, who started on switch studies, uh, who entered a study already virologically suppressed and were randomized to TAF or TDF regimens, you can see that really there were no discernible virologic outcome differences between the two groups. So, um, you know, the relative difference between TAF and TDF, uh, you know, was, was uh, minimal in women, similar as to what was seen in uh, men. And so the reason we generally use TAF in clinical practice isn't so much be, uh, due to virologic outcomes, but really because of the better um, side effect profile. Um, so the two major side effects um, that we consider are bone density and um, renal outcomes. So these graphs show the bone density outcomes. So uh, if you look at the, in the left panel, this is the treatment naive data. So um, in the orange is TDF. So you see this reduction in bone mineral density with either the spine or in the spine and the hip uh, that reliably occurs with TDF regimens. But you don't see uh, nearly as marked a decline with tenofovir alafenamide. And so these uh, changes in bone mineral density with tenofovir alafenamide are similar to what's seen in regimens that contain no tenofovir at all. Um, and similarly, in the switch study on the right panel, you can see that people that women that were, were remained on women that remained on TDF had really no change in their bone mineral density over time. Uh, but women who were switched to a TAF regimen and switched off of TDF generally had an increase in bone mineral density, um, which is good that these data support the bone mineral density benefits of TAF in women as well as has been seen in men. So remember, if you diagnose somebody with osteopenia uh, perhaps, or perhaps osteoporosis um, who still is on a TDF regimen for whatever reason, you know, one strategy you can consider is changing them off of TDF to a TAF regimen to get this increase in bone mineral density and then perhaps reserve any additional therapy for osteoporosis if they still uh, you know, meet criteria after a year or so after switching off of the TDF regimen. And these are the renal outcomes. Um, so you can see on the left is the change in um, uh, renal outcomes, so this is the cockroft galt equation. Uh, so you can see in both groups there's a decline in the GFR uh, by this measure um, early on, um, and, and really though a slightly better renal profile with the TAF regimen versus the TDF. So this probably isn't an early decline in renal function. It probably has to do with changes in weight and how the equation is calculated. And, and some of the other drugs that are paired can also interfere with creatinine um, excretion. So probably no change overall in the, the, the renal function for the TAF regimen. And if you look at the switch studies, so again, on the right panel, these are people that are generally switching off of TDF regimens. And you can see um, that when doing that, when switching off of TDF to TAP regimens, you see an increase in the um, glomerular filtration rate. Uh, 
so again, these data support the use of TAF in women and um, really the, give good evidence that, these benef that the benefit of TAF, namely the improved bone and renal outcomes, also um, women benefit from that as, as has been seen in men. Okay, so um, there's been a lot of attention um, around the use of integrase inhibitors in pregnancy or really around the time of um, conception. And uh, so there's a number of, uh, a few different studies that we're gonna talk about in this, um, in this area. First, we're gonna talk about the use of uh, raltegravir versus efavirenz in women, pregnant women living with HIV. So this was a multi-center open-label phase four clinical trial. They enrolled 408 ART-naive women who were pregnant uh, at um, 20 to 37 weeks of gestation. So usually these were women that were diagnosed during pregnancy. Uh, and they were um, randomized to either have raltegravir in um, NRTIs or efavirenz in NRTIs. Uh, they were followed through for 24 weeks through post-delivery, and their primary endpoint was really HIV RNA at the time of delivery. They also looked at discontinuation of raltegravir or efavirenz prior to delivery and grade three or greater adverse events in both the mother and infant. Uh, and they had some secondary endpoints of <clears throat> the rate of viral load decline with the ART use as well as pregnancy outcomes and, and infant HIV infection. So um, the major result was that at the time of delivery, there was uh, better virologic outcomes with raltegravir. Uh, so 99% were less than 200 copies with raltegravir compared to 97% on efavirenz, just achieving statistical significance. What I think is really important is to break down the subgroup according to when they were enrolled in the study and really at what point during pregnancy did they start antiretroviral therapy. So um, if women started uh, at 20 to 28 weeks of um, pregnancy, there really didn't seem to be any difference in the virologic, uh, rates of virologic suppression at the time of delivery. As you would expect, if they, were, if they started antiretroviral therapy closer to the time of pregnancy, uh, you achieved virologic suppression more often with the raltegravir group than you did with the efavirenz group. So they did not see um, any difference in grade three events for the infants or mothers between arms. Um, there, were, um, there was mother-to-child transmission of HIV that occurred in six infants and only one raltegravir infant, um, you know, not, not statistically different, but, you know, did seem to favor the raltegravir. Um, so we got um, slightly different, uh, or, I'm sorry, I should say um, for this study, um, I didn't show you the decline in viral load, but similar to other studies of integrase inhibitors, the integrase inhibitor drove down the viral load much sooner or much faster than did the NNRTI. Um, so that's why the, um, the rates of suppression at the time of delivery were better with raltegravir than they were with efavirenz. Um, we did, there was a similar study that compared dolutegravir versus efavirenz for pregnant women living with HIV. So remember the concerns about dolutegravir and neural tube defects, which we're going to talk about in just a moment, um, really have to do with um, receiving dolutegravir around the time of conception and in, in the first trimester. There's no evidence that uh, initiation of dolutegravir in the second and third trimesters is problematic for the neural tube defects. So. Um, in this study, uh, a similar design, a randomized multicenter open label phase three clinical trial, enrolled 268 ART-naive pregnant women living with HIV at greater than 28 weeks of gestation, so slightly different group, and followed them for 72 weeks post-delivery. And the primary endpoint was HIV RNA less than 1,000 copies at the time of delivery, 
uh, transmission of HIV from mother to child and maternal and infant safety. All right. Sorry, I'm going to move to the phone. I saw a comment that the speaker is um, spotty, so let me see if this improves. Um, okay, next slide. Um, so these are the primary endpoints. So we have um, on the far left, uh, you can see that the viral load less than 50 was achieved much more often with Jolutegravir than Efavirin, so 74 versus 43%. If you look um, according to the baseline um, viral load, uh, that was a, pronounced in both groups, but you know, especially um, evident in the viral load over 100,000. Um, and so uh, they saw this difference in people that um, started at less than 36 and greater than 36 weeks of gestation. So what was interesting, there, there were three cases of mother-to-child transmission in this, in this study, and all were, uh, all occurred in the Dolutegravir group. So, you know, not statistically different. Um, and there were four stillbirths that occurred, all for di in, uh, women randomized to Dolutegravir versus zero for efavirenz. The infant deaths, five in Dolutegravir and three in the efavirenz group. Um, so these aren't statistically significantly different, um, but you know they're really. Uh, it, it, I guess the overall message is that the viral load suppression, at achieving an undetectable viral load, does happen more often with um, initiating an integrase inhibitor. I think we would need larger studies to really say um, anything more about infant safety of various ART regimens. Um, so uh, as far as integrase inhibitor during pregnancy, um, so there were prospective analyses of pregnancy outcomes that were reported at CROI, um, and really they did not show any association between neural tube defects and integrase inhibitor use, including dolutegravir or raltegravir. Um, so there was a hospital-based surveillance program in Uganda that found no significant association between neural tube defects and maternal HIV status or antiretroviral use. Um, there, were, there was analysis from the antiretroviral pregnancy re registry, which again uh, reported no neural tube defects after integrase inhibitor use in pregnancy. And this was, um, however, this registry is mostly from Europe and North America where neural tube incidence is low. Um, in addition, there was some speculation that um, perhaps the neural tube defects that were seen in the Botswana um, cohort study that led to this um, concern and warning against using, using dolutegravir around conception or an early pregnancy, there was a, a speculation that this somehow might be a related, related to some interaction between dolutegravir and folate or some use of dolutegravir in um, areas that don't typically supplement folate. Um, and so there was a study that looked at um, folate levels in people, women on dolutegravir versus efavirenz, and actually found that dolutegravir, women on dolutegravir had higher serum folate levels. Um, so there didn't seem to be any um, clue as to the mechanism of uh, the potential mechanism of the neural tube defects in that analysis. Um, so overall, um, there's additional data that's going to be reported from the SAPAMO cohort from Botswana um, about the association or if there are additional cases of neural tube defects in women that have received dolutegravir. Um, so I think that it's important that people are watching this very closely and that there are robust um, cohorts for which we can look for these neural tube defects defects for women that have already been receiving dolutegravir. Um, so I hope that we'll receive some clarity on this issue in the coming months and year. Okay, um, so there was an analysis of um, levonorgestrel implants and efavirenz. Um, so these implants are a popular um, 
contraceptive method worldwide. Um, there was a prior study that looked at an interaction of the implant and um, a favorance based regimen and found that a favorance dramatically lowered the levels of the levonorge or the lowered the levonorgestrel levels, uh, potentially compromising efficacy or contraceptive efficacy. So these investigators looked at a strategy to try and overcome this interaction by using a double dose of the implant, so basically two implants um, for, to use as contraception. And so they theorized that this could overcome the interaction and lead to acceptable um, levels and ex acceptable contraceptive efficacy. However, they did not find, find that it really completely overcame this interaction, so they did see an increase in the levels. So um, if you look at the, this pharmacokinetic profiles, here in the green you see the historical levels. So this was the interaction between uh, with efavirenz, so efavirenz lowering the levonorgestrel levels uh, as compared to the historical control group, uh, you know, not on ART in blue. And so in red is how is the results from doubling the levonorgestrel uh, implant. You can see they did have an increase in the levels, but really not to the levels seen in women uh, not on efavirenz. And so they found that 46% of the women with the double dose levonorgestrel had low levels compared to 18% um, of historical controls. So really a, um, a marked difference in, um, in the levels and one that potentially compromises the contraceptive efficacy. Um, uh, another study looked at the quadrivalent HPV vaccine. Um, so we know that the quadrivalent HPV vaccine or HPV vaccines in general work to prevent HPV infections. There's been a number of um, generally retrospective studies that have suggested that women with um, cervical disease or high cell, H cell, the, high, the cervical cancer precursor, um, that they respond better to treatments if they've been previously vaccinated with the uh, HPV vaccine. Uh, so um, I was one of the investigators on the study with um, Cindy Fernhaber, and so we conducted this randomized uh, placebo-controlled trial that enrolled women with cervical hysil in Johannesburg. And so they either received the vaccine, so they came in with Hysil, received a vaccine or placebo, came back a month later, received a second vaccine or placebo, and also underwent the LEAP treatment of their cervical Hysil. And they came back at week 26 for a third vaccine, as well as colposcopy uh, and biopsies, and came back at week 52 for another colposcopy and biopsies. Um, so what we found was not what we hypothesized. There really was no uh, discernible difference in the um, recurrence rate of cervical hysil after the vaccine. So the vaccine did not improve outcomes to LEAP treatment. And if we look just at histology or just at CIN3, again, we, we didn't really see any differences. So we did not find any evidence for the strategy of vaccinating women with cervical hysil or cervical um, HPV disease uh, to improve outcomes, um, unfortunately. Uh, I will note that the rates of recurrence are really alarmingly high in this population, you know, 30% with histologic recurrence of cervical hysil uh, through a year. And this was women that were enrolled in the study were generally virologically suppressed and doing well on the ART treatment, but still we observed these poor outcomes. Um, so we're going to move on to some complications and co-infections. Uh, so one study you might not have noticed but is kind of practical in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, there's a study, a randomized study, comparing two treatments for LGV proctitis, so doxycycline versus extended azithromycin. Uh, so it was a randomized open-label trial of doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice daily for 21 days versus azithromycin, one gram weekly for three doses. So they randomized 136 men who have sex with men, 95% of whom were living with HIV. Um, they had pretty high clinical cure 
uh, rates in both groups, above 95% in the doxy group and 99% in the azithro group. Um, and as well, they had very high rates of microbiologic cure, 100% in the doxy group and 97% in the azithro group. Um, so remember, if you diagnose somebody with chlamydia in the rectum, um, the, it's very important to assess any symptoms. Um, so if they have any rectal symptoms and if you have access to an endoscopy and it looks like they have inflammation or discharge or something like that, um, those are people that should be treated for LGV. We unfortunately don't have great diagnostics and clinical practice that can tell us whether it's just regular chlamydia or LGV. So remember to treat for LGV proctitis um, if you have a chlamydia NAT that's positive in the rectum and the person has any symptoms. Um, so this study would, um, would uh, um, suggest that um, either this weekly is a thromycin strategy as a reasonable alternative for the doxycycline. Um, next, uh, sorry, just a, a variety of topics here on the comorbidities. Um, the next is the VAX study, and it's HIV and the risk of sudden cardiac death. Um, so remember, um, uh, they found overall that people living with HIV had a 15% higher risk of sudden cardiac death um, than people without HIV. And uh, they did an analysis that looked at various CD4 strata and seemed that this increased risk was predominant among people who had low CD4 counts. Uh, if you look at the, um, in the bottom half, this is, uh, had to do with a viral load analysis, and it seems that all of the increased risk was really for people that had poorly controlled HIV. Um, and all of these models were adjusted for a wide variety of factors, um, including uh, you know, smoking, hypertension, lipids, et cetera. Um, and uh, to put the, the risk in, in context, uh, sorry, if you see on the, in this analysis about 75% increased risk of or increased hazard of the sudden cardiac death in people with uncontrolled viremia. Um, the, this puts you in the range of the similar uh, increased hazard from cardiovascular disease or smoking. Um, and so there's a number of risk factors for the sudden cardiac death. Uh, and HIV, uncontrolled HIV, seems to be an additional risk factor. Uh, there was an analysis of opioid overdose deaths in people living with HIV. So this is from the National HIV Surveillance System. Uh, it includes HIV diagnoses from all 50 states and Washington, D.C. Uh, they categorized the opioid overdose deaths using ICD-10 coding and calculated some of the crude death rates among people uh, with HIV infection. They looked at some different um, subcategories of, um, according to demographics, geography, HIV transmission risk, and looked at these changes over time. Um, so what they found was that the overall death rate for people living with HIV declined over this period from 2011 to 2015, so a 13% decrease. Uh, I suppose because we're diagnosing HIV earlier, having have better treatments, better focus on adherence, and better outcomes. However, the increase in um, the number of deaths actually uh, increased um, over time, a 43% increase in the number of opioid-related deaths. Uh, remember, these are not absolute numbers, 23, 28, 31, here in the blue. Um, sorry, let me use the clicker. Uh, these aren't absolute. These are death rates per 100,000. So overall, there were uh, 1,363 deaths uh, over this time period in people living with HIV related to opioid overdose. Um, and the people with injection, history of injection drug use really had the, were most likely or had the highest rates of the opioid overdose and had the, the largest increase in, um, in the rates of this, uh, of death due to that cause. Um, and so either injection drug use or uh, MSM and injection drug use 
Um, but you still can see some of the increases, uh, um, percentage increases, quite large for heterosexual contact as well. Um, and there's some, several studies that looked at integrase inhibitors and weight gain. Um, so uh, the first was a multivariate analysis of weight gain during following ART initiation, and they used a variety of uh, studies from January 07 through December 2016. There were about uh, nearly 5,000 people that were on integrase inhibitor regimens, either elvotegravir, raltegravir, and less on dolutegravir. In the same uh, time period, they had 7,500 people on uh, PI-based regimens, uh, nearly 12,000 on NNRTI-based regimens. Um, so they uh, did find a higher weight gain with integrase-based therapy versus NNRTI-based regimens, and with dalutegravir or raltegravir as compared to elvotegravir. They did not find uh, that this um, weight gain with integrase inhibitors varied by sex or race. Um, so this gives you some of the graphs. Uh, you can see in red is the overall uh, weight gain. This is through five years. Um, so six uh, kilogram weight gain as opposed to, uh, you know, five with the PI and 4.3. So really not large absolute difference, but um, statistically significant differences nonetheless. And if you look at just at um, the various integrase inhibitors you can see on the right panel, the dolutegravir seem to have slightly higher weight gain than the raltegravir or elvotegravir. Um, there is an analysis of this with, um, from the AIDS clinical trials group that combined a number of studies um, that are uh, different cohorts studies where participants in this cohort switched uh, from another regimen to an integrase inhibitor-based regimen and then looked at the uh, weight gain before and after the switch to regimens, or to integrase inhibitor regimens. Um, and so in the bottom, you can see the various subgroups, and they're really, you know, slightly differing results, but um, generally um, increase in the weight gain after um, integrase inhibitors, there's a few subgroups where it was not seen. Um, but this uh, suggests that it, it really may be, um, that there may be greater increases with the integrase inhibitor switch among women, blacks, and people over 60. So you can see already that there's starting to be some slightly differing conclusions from these different studies. Um, and some additional data looking at the various integrase inhibitors. Uh, we have dolutegravir, elvotegravir, and raltegravir, and uh, there seem to be a higher um, weight gain with the dolutegravir regimen as opposed to the um, elvotegravir or raltegravir. Um, and uh, so it's, it's important to note that some of these analyses are limited by relatively small subsets. And again, if we compare to the prior study, you know, we're not seeing the exact same results or patterns for this weight gain. Um, this is an additional study, which um, I like the way they approached this, where they looked at um, not necessarily just the absolute change in weight, but, you know, the proportion of people having a greater than 3% annual weight gain, so a more cl clinically significant weight gain. Um, so they used EMR and prescription data and looked at people who switched regimens during this time period from 2013 to 2017. Um, and they had 3,500 patients from 21 states in Washington, D.C., and they found that 30% of them had an annualized weight gain greater than 3%. Uh, 16% had a weight loss of greater than 3%, and the rest were uh, between those two results. Um, so they did a multivariate analysis of the predictors for weight gain. Um, so it's hard to read, but um, this uh, red arrow uh, points to the integrase inhibitor, and so these various, um, this the various uh, relative or odds ratios for these 
different factors are ordered um, from largest impact for weight gain to the smallest impact or the largest impact for weight loss. And so you can see that integrase inhibitor really in this multivariable analysis didn't seem to be associated with weight gain. They found other factors such as female sex, age uh, less than 30, psychiatric disorders, and not surprisingly being underweight at baseline, being a predictor of uh, more significant weight gain. So um, I think that these data are interesting. I think it's still an early, um, early times in this field. There's still no known mechanism for this integrase inhibitor weight gain that I'm aware of. Um, but it's something that we're following. I think overall, um, obesity is a big problem in our clinical practices, and so you know we need to we need to really understand this, and um, we need to really understand the relationship of our ART choices to this more clinically significant weight gain. So I'm sure there will be additional data to hopefully clarify the situation. Uh, I should say there was one other study. Uh, that was interesting. He was looking at cabotegravir, another integrase inhibitor used as PrEP and weight gain, so a long-acting injectable um, integrase inhibitor. And so this is interesting because it's looking at people who are HIV uninfected, so it kind of takes the HIV part out of this, and as well, people were not on a comparator um, ART regimen or PrEP regimen in this particular study. Um, so what they found was that if, uh, if you look at the, that there was no significant weight gain with the long-acting cabotegravir versus placebo for PrEP, um, greater than 5% weight gain was seen in 22% with the long-acting cab and 18% with placebo not statistically significantly different. They didn't see any differential effects by BMI at baseline, sex at birth, race, ethnicity, smoking. Um, and no statistically significant difference in the fasting glucose or lipids between the two groups. And you can see the um, overall um, change in, in weight. So the overall change was a gain in 1.1 um, kilogram in the cabotegravir versus 1.0 kilogram in the placebo. So really no, no difference uh, between those. So, um, so we have, just in summary, um, we have an HIV capsid inhibitor that you should keep your eye on that's promising for long-acting antiretroviral therapy. So we look forward to studies of the antiviral activity with that compound. Um, we reviewed the phase three clinical trials of long-acting CAB and Rilpivirin, and it really said great data that suggests that this will be approved by the FDA. Um, and this could be a novel treatment regimen for many of our people patients living with HIV. Um, as far as uh, ART in women, we saw that integrase inhibitors drive down the viral load faster in women initiating ART in late pregnancy. Uh, we really didn't see, um, the, the studies weren't really powered to look at mother-to-child transmission or um, maternal outcomes, but hopefully additional studies will characterize the safety of integrase inhibitors in pregnancy. Uh, we had a number of new studies that did not find association with dolutegravir neural tube defects. However, the, these studies weren't well powered in and of themselves to, to really um, say anything definitive about this association. There's no change in recommendations at this point, uh, but there should be uh, additional data in the future that will um, confirm whether there is an association or suggest that there's not. Uh, and again, there are multiple studies that examined integrase inhibitors and weight gain uh, that saw some conflicting results or some conflicting interpretations, rather. Um, so we really need some additional data to understand this clinical problem of weight gain in our patients living with HIV. Um, so we'll do the post-test question. So two studies on long-acting CAB and Rilpivirin were presented, which correctly summarizes the findings. 
improvement. Yes, so the long-acting CAB in rilpivirine was not inferior to oral ART in both studies. And although injection site reactions were common, they rarely led to discontinuation, you know, less than 1% in each study. So really uh, uh, great, great results. All right, um, so I think some of you have been um, asking questions in the chat boxes. Um, let me see if there's anything else slide-wise. Okay. All right. Um, so we have a question here. Is the recommendation still to avoid dolutegravir in women with childbearing potential and in the first trimester? Um, so yes, that still is a recommendation. I would say uh, it's not necessarily women with childbearing potential, but women that are intending to become pregnant or women that are not on effective um, contraception. Um, but yes, there is still the concern about neural tube defects and um, in that population. So, I mean, I do think that you, they could be discussed with the, the woman and, um, you know, there might be some situations where that drug is still um, chosen, but it really needs to be an informed um, discussion. But the guidelines right now recommend against using dolutegravir in that situation. Um, so the next question is, is a 2% increase in bone mineral density really all that important clinically, especially if TDS goes generic, which I think it is generic, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's less expensive right now. Um, so would the higher cost of TAF really warrant a uh, change for a 2% increase in bone mineral density? So I think it's a great question um, and one that I can't really answer. Um, I think that this is an example of where various cost effectiveness analyses would would be helpful. Um, you know, the the bone mineral density we don't care about in and of itself. It's really the complications of fracture, uh, which can be quite morbid. So I think that as we have more and more aging patients with living with HIV, you know, these issues of fractures and the morbidity from them are going to become more and more important. So it's, um, there's two sides to that, but definitely something that could be, um, uh, should be examined further. Um, so there are other, other options, I should say, besides TAF. There's also, you know, the dolutegravir uh, 3TC regimen that would give you the same benefits. There's the dolutegravir ropivirine regimen that would give you the same benefits. Um, so there are other, potentially other options besides just TAF or TDF. Uh, but I think that the, you know, it would require some more sophisticated um, cost modeling to really answer that question, but it's very important. Um, so the next question, is there a TAF option uh, being explored for PrEP? I will, if you want to hear more about it, uh, I think they have an archived webinar from Susan Bookbinder that reviewed all the PrEP um, or all the uh, prevention aspects of CROI. But just to say that there was a study presented, a randomized study of TDF, FTC Truvada versus TAF, FTC Descovi for HIV PrEP um, and showed uh, non-inferiority of TAF, FTC. Uh, there were very low numbers of infections in both groups, um, both regimens seem to work very well. Um, so it's not approved currently, TAF FTC for uh, PrEP, um, but, you know, I'm sure that there will be discussions of that um, indication in the future. Um, I think that right now if you had a particular patient that could not take TDF, uh, for renal functions or whatever reason, um, I personally think based on that data that the TAF FTC would be a very reasonable option for uh, PrEP for someone who, who needed it and, and had their medical contraindications. Um, so the next question was about are there medical contraindications for rilpivirine long-acting injectables? So I think you're getting at are there, uh, there's a number of food interactions with rilpivirine and the proton pump inhibitor interactions with uh, rilpivirine. Um, yes, you would obviate those with the, the um, injection, so you wouldn't have to be concerned about the food interaction or the proton pump 
inhibitor interaction or the acid suppression interaction. Uh, the one caveat is that you do have that month or of oral lead-in. That's the approach that's being used right now. Um, so if you're not able to, um, you would have to worry about those drug-drug 